Welcome to the Succeed Against the Odds podcast. My name is Francesca Anastasi, also known as Sabea. I'm a multi-passionate entrepreneur. I'm your host and mentor. And each week we bring you an inspiring person, an expert or message, and some behind the scenes to help you ignite and unleash your potential. Thanks so much for listening. Welcome back to another episode of the Succeed Against the Odds show. Today in this episode, I have the privilege to have with me Dr. Marquita Blades. Welcome, Marquita. Hello, Francesca. Thank you for having me. And we did attempt this once before, and we had some technical glitches, so I'm very happy that we have been able to reconnect and do this again and give it another shot. So, Marquita, as we... As I got to know you a little bit in the previous interview that never aired, (laughs) uh, you have a fascinating story. So for the sake of our audience, members that may not know who you are, would you mind sharing who Marquita Blaze is or Dr. Marquita Blaze is? Sure, sure. So um, you're right. My story has been um, quite interesting. and, And it's funny, since the last time we spoke, I have been working with my mentor and he kind of brought some things to my realization um, about my own story that I really hadn't thought about. So it may sound a little more interesting this time, I don't know. But um, I was a high school science teacher for 16 years. I taught primarily biology, chemistry, and physics. And um, anybody who knew me, I would say during the first half of that time could just tell you how much I truly enjoy being a teacher and everything that came with that. Um, Also, I spent my summers managing STEM programs, national STEM programs for high achieving high school students. So my years revolved around teaching in some capacity. I really never wanted or felt like I needed a break from it because it was the job that I had always intended to do since I was a child. But about halfway through my career, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness, lupus, and um, it really just sent me from one end of the spectrum to the other, where I went from being a high-functioning, enthusiastic, engaging teacher every day to being someone who could uh, barely pull myself out of bed in the morning and would drag myself into work and barely interact with my students basically just doing enough to get through the day, to survive an evaluation should an administrator come in, Um, just really was living in survival mode for the most part. And so um, that's a little bit of the backstory of who I am, that experience. I worked that way for about eight years, and it finally led me to the conclusion that because I did love teaching so much and I love students, And I do operate in a spirit of excellence that um, it was just really time for me to kind of hang up my hat when it came to being in the classroom full time. And so I resigned and I launched my consulting company, Dr. Blades Consulting. And that's what I've been doing for the last couple of years. I have been speaking and training teachers and also uh, hosting an internet radio show where teachers and other education professionals come on and we discuss the issues that uh, we're currently facing in the field of education today. It's fascinating how you turned a challenge into something really positive. So now you can work around your health versus forcing yourself to push through. Does the lupus still affect you the way it did before? Um, It does not affect me the way that it did before. I saw some immediate changes once I resigned. So that uh, daily stress, even when you enjoy what you do, there's still a certain amount of stress involved just because of the um, preparation required. And that's in any job, but with teaching especially, I would say that those stress levels are heightened even more because you have so many individuals who are looking to you for guidance and they're bringing all of their problems and energy and kind of dumping it on you. And even if you enjoy that work, you don't realize um, how much it really takes out of you. So immediately I saw some differences when I resigned. And then I uh, really focused my energy on moving from 
relying on prescription treatments into doing a more holistic treatment. And so that took a while, but I did get my lupus under remission. Um, And so I've only had one major flare up since September 2016. So I would say I'm doing a lot better and there's still a bit of a ways to go though. Well, we're glad to hear you are doing better. Thank you. There's nothing more important than health because when that's not there, it just pretty much affects everything we do. It does. You, I mean, you can't pour from an empty cup. And certainly teaching is a, p- a profession that is, there's just far too many factors involved and there's too much at stake to have anyone doing it who's not functioning at their best capacity for whatever reason that may be. Mm-hmm. And as a teacher, you're constantly pouring. Constantly, yes. Right. <laughs> so that would, that would be a factor. Now, for those of us who don't know what the STEM project is, would you mind giving us a little bit of insight on that? Because I've never heard of it. Maybe because I'm in Canada, I don't know. But we have an international audience. So if you could shed a little bit of light on what that is. So for those who aren't familiar uh, with STEM, I'll just go over the acronym as well. STEM is Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. I managed uh, STEM programs for students who were particularly interested in either becoming doctors or engineers or other science and technology related fields. And those programs were residential. They were held around the country. Um, Ten days, the students would come and they would engage in everything that it took to pursue whichever career path they had selected. And so that would include what type of education you needed, and then they would participate in specifically designed curriculum that would expose them to the same situations that they would encounter once they were in college and once they were in the career in the career field. um, They also had, we had guest speakers from the industry come in and talk to them so that they could engage one-on-one and ask questions about uh, what does it really take behind the scenes to pursue this career and be successful. And then we also partnered with industry facilities like hospitals and medical schools and um, other companies that allowed the students to come in and shadow professionals so that they could get a feel for what a day in the life was like. And those programs were not my unique programs, but those were programs that I did work with and I did contribute to um, developing a lot of the student experiences as well as hiring, training, managing the staff, and a lot of the other logistical aspects of those programs. Sounds like a great project. But you also are the founder of the Mediocre Teacher Project. That is correct. So So, yeah, tell us about that and what led you to create that. The Mediocre Teacher Project was born out of, I guess, my recovery from having to resign from teaching because it really wasn't something that I wanted to do. I kept thinking that I could just do something and change something with the way that I was approaching my health care and it would just become okay again and, and I could just continue teaching. So it wasn't an easy thing even though I was in pain every day and I knew that I could do better if I, if I felt better. It's, that didn't make it any easier for me to step away. So um, when I started my consulting business, my first focus was on how do I help other teachers who may be in this same position, not necessarily due to an illness, but it could be because they were going through a divorce or they experienced a tragic death in the family, or they may not even know why they are functioning in that survival mode that I described where they're just kind of showing up and going through the motions. You know, teachers hit burnout for various reasons. And because it was so fresh with me, I wanted to do something that could address that for other teachers because I knew other people were in the same situation and they didn't have the ability to resign as I did. And so they're going to keep showing up in those classrooms every day. And they're going to keep interacting with those students. And one thing I do know is that when teachers are not excited about the work that they're doing, ultimately the students suffer. And and what can I do to prevent those students from suffering? And so I came up with the Mediocre Teacher Project 
as a way of first just helping teachers recognize that this is the truth of your situation. This is where you are. And now what are some strategies that you can use to kind of get you through it? And so it started as a a two hour workshop where I would just explore some things with the teachers and have them go through some reflective activities. And I wanted them just to walk away, not even knowing exactly what the solution was, but just being aware of the fact that something needs to change. And these are the options that I have. And and the two options that we would typically discuss would be getting some coaching on some strategies that they could use in the classroom daily that would make their role as the teacher a little less stressful, but keep the instruction engaging. So kind of coaching you through it, helping you work through while you still go to work every day, but giving you some tools that you can use so that um, the planning isn't as taxing and, and that type of thing. But then also um, the other option was maybe it's time to consider doing something else and and maybe you should be planning your exit. (laughs) So you also talk about recognizing the signs of the mediocrity trap for people out there who are teachers or coaches or trainers, because I'm sure that applies to all of us (laughs) who share information and train people. How do you recognize those signs? Um, The way that I I define the mediocrity trap is by looking at some of the basic things that a person has done at a high level. And when they fail to do those basic things at a high level, that signals that um, something is off there. And when I say basic, I'm referring to things like, and and I'll just keep it uh, teacher related because that's what I have the most experience with. Um, getting to work on time, number one, and just having your classroom set up and ready for a lesson. There are some teachers who don't prepare in advance ever, and that's just how they function. But if you have a teacher who's highly organized and always prepared days in advance, and now they're just kind of coming in and flying by the seat of their pants, something might be wrong. Or um, getting so behind in grades that you have nothing to submit at the end of the grading period. I mean, I've been in a situation where grades had to be submitted for report cards by four o'clock and I had maybe 10 or 12 assignments that I hadn't even looked at yet. And so I had nothing to put into the computer for my students or not turning in your lesson plans on time or the types of lessons that you deliver. At one point, I would do a lab every single day with my chemistry students. And then it got to the point where my students were asking me, are we ever gonna do a lab in here? And so those were the things for me that just, that kind of triggered. So a teacher would know that they're in the mediocrity trap when they look at what was the most highly effective period of my career? And what were the characteristics that I displayed during that time? And if they're not displaying most or all of those characteristics and not just, not only not displaying them, but actually functioning on the total opposite end of the spectrum, that's when they know that maybe they've hit a point of burnout. Interesting. How would you, you you train instructors, you consult teachers. What would you say a lot of teachers do that is not necessarily productive and they're not even aware of? that could Um, easily be fixed? One thing that teachers could easily uh, fix in their instruction, I would say is just um, having um, lower expectations of their students, you know, just kind of watering down whatever it is that they want to do. I see a lot of teachers doing that because of the, and, and rightfully so, because of the outputs that we sometimes get from students or maybe because we know that the students are not at a certain reading level or they haven't had certain prerequisites and and we've noticed that they're weak in certain areas that they should have mastered before they got to us. And so the teacher will resolve to, um, I'm gonna change the course or I'm gonna lower the expectations. Well, I was gonna require them to keep full lab notebooks, but I don't think this class is ready for that. And I think um, 
like you said, I won't necessarily call it, call it a mistake, but I think the remedy to that is to say, even though this class may not have been exposed to this before, I'm still gonna push forward with the expectations that I had set for them. Because I do know, working with any demographic of students, during the school year, I typically taught in Title I schools, which means that the school had a certain percentage of free and reduced lunch, uh, students receiving free and reduced lunch due to their socioeconomic background. But in the summer programs that I work with, those students come from an affluent background. But regardless of what a student's uh, financial standing is, I have noticed across the board that they will rise to the expectations that they know have been set in any situation. And so I think teachers should just kind of stick to their guns about how they want to run their class and, and what um, they want to challenge students to do, even if there are some deficits that exist. So challenge them to rise to the expectation if they seem to be Absolutely. Low, uh, yeah, that is excellent. That's excellent. And they will do it. When they respect you, they will do anything that you ask them to do. That applies to all of us. It's not just for students <laughs> in high school. I, I believe that is like a, it should be part of a, another golden rule that no matter where we're at in life, I, I can see a metaphor there that if, you know, if something needs to be done and there is that expectation, that we hold ourselves accountable to it, we can achieve that. Yeah, and I think we owe it to each other to hold um, each other accountable as well, because we don't do that a lot of times for fear of offending people or, or whatever. Yeah. And a lot of times we let the accountability go. You're right. Wow. Fascinating job you have. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, have you come across a teacher or two or three who have done things slightly differently that have been so amazing that have inspired you to share what they've done with others? Have you come across any of that? Oh, absolutely. I would say, um, so when I'm not doing the Mediocre Teacher Project, I am conducting STEM instruction, you know, instructional strategies workshops for STEM classes. A lot of the strategies that I have, though, can be used across the board, really in any content area. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is specifically what you just asked is because I've seen a teacher doing something, doing it really well, and then I will take it and adapt it to my content area. And so over the years, you just kind of develop an arsenal of strategies that work for you. Mm -hmm. But it's usually like that. It's kind of things that you've observed from other teachers, that's what we all kind of do. We borrow from each other. We make it fit to our students and our content area, you know, adapt and adjust. So I would, I think most teachers do that as well. Um, it's very rare that you find a teacher who everything that they're doing is completely original. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> they would be like one in one. Well, we have some people out here who have developed some really innovative programs that I look at and say, how did they think of that? And, you know, why can't I think of something really, really unique like that? But the fact of the matter is, those types of ideas are so few and far between. So, you know, I just have to get over the fact that I haven't come up with that groundbreaking strategy yet, but maybe it will happen one day. We always need those few innovators, and then we get inspired by them, and then we end up developing from those. So we need, we need all kinds, right? Yes, we do. Not everybody can be an innovator, otherwise <laughs> there'd be too much confusion. You wouldn't know where to look. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so what's the next project for you, Marquita? So um, I've kind of not really veered off. Uh, of course, my education consulting is always my passion because teaching is my first love. But um, I have done, I've put together an anthology, two anthologies, <laughs> actually. Um, you know, I'm doing so many things as I'm speaking to you. I'm thinking, how could I not have that present of mind that I've done that? So we put together the Mediocre Teacher Project anthology where I have invited some other teachers who were willing to share their own stories with mediocrity. And so I believe that there are seven or, seven or eight of us, and we've written some stories about what it was like to be in the mediocrity trap, 
and how we turn those situations around. And that will be coming out in early fall. I believe September is when that is scheduled for release. But I also put together another anthology that addresses my experience with chronic illness. And, and the reason why I did too is because I just couldn't decide which story needed to be told the most if I needed to really talk about um, being diagnosed with an illness that would completely change everything about your life or if I needed to talk about how I had to give up the career that I wanted since I was a kid because I had the illness and I couldn't decide between the two so I said oh I'll just do both of them and so I, I have a second anthology that will be released in August and it's called Chronicles of the Chronically Ill, where each person is sharing their story with their chronic illness and how their lives were impacted by it. But um, further, they're also sharing how they're able to live beyond the diagnosis. And so for this anthology, I required that each person, and I don't, I don't want this to sound any type of way, but um, each person did have to still be functioning at a very high level so that they could give that story of true overcoming and say, well, these are the things that I've still been able to achieve in spite of now having to live with this new normal. Wow. Sounds very inspiring. Um, I just got the stories from my publisher. Um, I've seen them for the first time, I would say about a week and a half ago. And it is incredibly overwhelming with inspiration. Like I couldn't even read more than one story in the same day. That's how powerful it was. Wow. So if our listeners want to, is there a way to pre-order or you just have to wait for the actual launch in September? There will be a way to pre-order. Um, it is so fresh. Um, so I'm waiting for my publisher to let me know exactly when she's going to open up pre-orders. But when that happens, uh, they, they will be on my author's page on Amazon. And I am listed as uh, Marquita Smith Blades on Amazon. Beautiful. And if our listeners want to reach directly to you and get in touch with you, how do they do that? Listeners can reach me by going to drmarquitablades.com and there's a link to contact me. I'm actually on my email all the time. So that's the best way to reach me. Yeah. And we, we will have that link in the show notes. So you listeners can just go in the show notes to get the proper spelling and get straight to the website. That's fantastic. Anything else you want to share with us? I also have an internet radio show. It's called the Dr. Marquita Blades Show, Candid Conversations That Create Change. And it's a platform for educators. So I invite teachers, administrators, um, youth advocacy professionals, students even have been on my show. And we just sit down and we discuss all of the trends and issues that are currently going on in education. And we also talk about what some of the possible solutions to those uh, issues might be. And as a celebration of the one-year anniversary of the Dr. Marquita Blade Show, I've decided to have the Candid Educator Award Ceremony. So that will be December 15th, 2018 in Atlanta, Georgia, where we will be bringing in um, some of the nation's top speakers and consultants in education, and we will be honoring the unsung heroes. And so I'm specifically focusing on teachers, bus drivers, custodians, uh, paraprofessionals who wouldn't necessarily win that award in their school, but they are working very hard, flying under the radar. And um, the work that they're doing is having a great impact, even though they may not be getting a high level of attention placed on them. And so it will be a celebration just to let them know. Uh, from one educator to another. I see your hard work. I appreciate you. And uh, we celebrate you as an education community. What a beautiful thing to do to give recognition to people who, who are impactful in their way and don't typically get recognized. As you said, what a beautiful thing you're doing. That's fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you. It shows you have a beautiful heart. Oh, that's so kind of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I love that. 
That, that's very nice. That's very nice you're doing that. I'm sure it's, this is the first time you're doing it. This will be the first time. Um, you know, Francesca, I just love teachers and I always have. I thank my mom for that because she raised me to be a good student. I can honestly say she prepared me for the school experience by um, teaching me the basics at home. So that's number one. She sent me into the school ready to learn and with um, enough knowledge that my teachers could work with me. But it wasn't just that, it was the, the respect factor that she instilled in me and the way that she interacted with and treated my teachers. And so I just always loved them and that's why I wanted to be one of them. And now that I'm not one um, in the traditional capacity anymore, I still love teachers. I still have a heart for teachers. And uh, sometimes people take it the wrong way when I say students don't come first, teachers come first. But that is my belief because if we don't have happy, healthy, whole, enthusiastic teachers, what are we putting in front of the kids? And then what energy are we transferring to the kids? And so I just don't see how the student can necessarily come first. We have to take care of our teachers. It totally makes sense. Now, you mentioned your internet, radio, is it internet radio show? It is an internet radio show. The station is called Instinct Radio, and it is based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Can anyone adjoin, uh, listen in, or is it just for people who are registered through the teacher's Oh, no, 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 no. So, yeah, let me share that. That's important because I, I would love to have people check out the show. Anyone can listen by going to instinctradio.net or um, they can simply follow me on Facebook because we also broadcast live via Facebook while we are uh, doing the show. And that's run off of my Facebook page. So I would um, really just encourage listeners to go to my website, drmarquitablades.com. It is a catch-all. I have a link to the radio show there as well. And I also have past episodes there so that they can check those out. I see the good you're doing. I am fascinated with what you're doing with the teachers, inspiring them to not only hold the students accountable and to step up to, you know, the level of expectations, a higher level of expectations, but you're also holding the teachers accountable by what you're doing. For them to step up. I love it. Well, thank you again um, for having me and just allowing me to, the platform to talk about this work because I think it is extremely important that we get back to putting our focus on it's the teacher. So, yeah, and it's so important because like you said, it's, if the teacher is, is healthy and is, is performing at, at a high level, so will the students by default. Fantastic. Well, it's been a total pleasure. I hope to connect with you soon. And you never know, maybe we'll meet in person one day. Oh, that would be fabulous. So thank you again for having me. And I, I look forward to um, also delving more into your show as well. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please pass it on. And it would mean so much to me if you would leave an honest review on iTunes. I'd really appreciate it. Till next time, embrace your magnificence.